Hello, everyone, and welcome to Network 2020's virtual briefing series. I am Joanna Gwoszewski, Senior Program Advisor at Network 2020, and I will be moderating today's discussion on Far Right Rising, Lessons from Europe for the 2024 U.S. Elections, a very timely subject. Before I introduce today's panelists, just a little information for those who are new to Network 2020. We are an inclusive international community that bridges the gap between the private sector and foreign policy worlds. To get more information about our programs and events, please visit our website at network2020.org. And now I have the pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Hans Kudnani is a visiting fellow at the Remark Institute at NYU. His previous experiences include director of the European programs at Chatham House, senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund, a Bosch public policy fellow, and research director at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He has authored several books on the topic of Germany and studied at both Oxford and Columbia universities. Jeremy Shapiro is the research director at the European Council on Foreign Relations. His areas of focus include U.S. foreign policy and transatlantic relations. His previous experience includes being a fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at Brookings and as a member of the U.S. State Department's policy planning staff. In addition, he served as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, providing strategic guidance on a wide variety of U.S. European foreign policy issues. And our third speaker is Tara Varma. She is a visiting fellow in the Center of the United States and Europe at Brookings. Her research focus includes French security as well as European sovereignty in traditional and non-traditional security fields. Her previous experience includes head of the Paris office of the European Council on Foreign Relations and the working group on the French European Council presidency. In November, 2023, she was awarded the honor of Knight of the National Order of the Merit of France. So welcome to you all and let's begin. The year 2024 will be remembered as one in which over 50% of the world's population participated in elections. In Europe, we have seen the rise in influence and government participation of far-right parties in many countries on the continent. Their electoral successes will have a considerable impact on how the European Union is governed moving forward, as well as the future of the NATO alliance. Is the rise of these far-right movements a recent short-term phenomenon or a signal of something longer term? Do these developments in Europe portend a similar outcome in the upcoming US elections? And what has been the impact of former U.S. President Trump and his MAGA movement on Europe's far-right parties? I look forward to discussing these and other questions with our panelists. So the first question is for all three speakers, but I'll start with you, Tara. As mentioned, we have seen the electoral success of far-right parties in the European Parliament, in France, in Germany, and most recently in Austria. What are the reasons for their growing influence? Are there any similarities and what lessons could be learned? So Tara, could you discuss these developments and specifically in regards to France and Italy? Sure, thanks a lot, Joanna, and thanks to Network 2020 for getting us together. Very happy to be on this panel with Jeremy and Hans. Um, you're right, there have been actually a lot of upheavals uh, in European elections this year, not only uh, the European parliamentary elections, but also European national elections. Um, let me start with France, my own country, um, where on the evening of June 10th, after four days of European elections across 27 uh, member states, Emmanuel Macron, France's president, seeing that his party came in second far behind the far-right Rassemblement National, uh, decided to dissolve the National Assembly, uh, subsequently calling for snap elections that were held three weeks uh, later, three and five we uh, three and four weeks later, sorry, on June 30th and July 7th. Um, he decided to conflate basically the results of these European elections uh, with uh, the French national political scene and decided to draw a conclusion from what happened at these European elections 
as, as a message sent to him by the French population. I should say, uh, just to be clear, that the Rassemblement National in the European elections got uh, almost 31% of the vote and Macron's party got 14.6%. So they, they, were, they came in second, but far behind, as I said. Um, and so what, what um, happened in the, first of all, in, in the days and weeks following the shock of the announcement of the dissolution uh, was a huge political mobilization by the far right, but also by other political parties in France, trying to, to, to see who would get the highest, um, highest results. And unsurprisingly, the Rassemblement National also came in first in the first round of the elections in France. Um, I think provoking, a sense of fear um, and panic all across. And so in a surprising turn of events, actually, they ended up coming in third in the second and final round of the election on, on July 7th, and a coalition of left-wing parties came in first, which was really not the scenario that was predicted by pollsters. Um, I think demonstrating, first of all, that citizens still have agency and that they're following debates quite a lot. But I think one of the reasons for um, the far right coming in third was that the one policy proposition they came up with uh, in the middle of the two rounds of the election was that they were going, uh, if when they came to power, to um, ban uh, dual um, national citizens from certain strategic positions in the administration. So this party, you know, whose normalization process it seemed that Marine Le Pen had taken to the greatest heights, actually the only policy proposition they, that they come up with at the time was not a social or economic pro proposition. It was really a proposition that demonstrated that they were still very much the racist and, and xenophobic party of, of their foundation and that that's what they still relied on. So they came in third because of the makeup of the political system in France, but in reality, they increased actually their vote share between the first and the second round. I should say that because that's also something that's important for the future of French and European politics. They got 31% of the vote in the first round of French uh, elections and actually managed to get 37% of the vote in the second round. But because of the makeup of the system, they came in third. Um, they are in fact today, the first French political party uh, in number of seats at the National Assembly. Um, they've managed to grow by 50% their number of seats basically from the, the, the constitution of the assembly before the dissolution and now. So they increased their vote share, they increased their number of seats at the National Assembly, which means that they have a higher budget uh, to, to actually hire consultants and advisors and, and uh, basically to professionalize themselves even more. Um, and they're looking, and I'll transition very, very briefly to Italy now, they're looking, of course, at the model that Giorgia Meloni has created in Italy. Giorgia Meloni comes from a post-fascist party, very much on the far right. And I think Marine Le Pen wants to emulate uh, um, her model and, and basically to try and implement it in France. She's one, you know, looking at the 2027 uh, presidential election in France that's coming up. There might be another dissolution of the National Assembly by Emmanuel Macron um, next summer. And so Georgia Meloni is really perceived at the, as this model by uh, populists and conservatives to follow as much as possible because she's made herself indispensable both to the far right and to the center right. Uh, um, poles of power in Europe. Um, I'll stop here, and I know that we'll discuss uh, with Hans and Jeremy as well. So let me just stop here, and, and we can turn to to my colleagues as well. Great, thanks so much, Tara. That's a very good, quick summary um, of where things stand in both countries. And now turning to you, Hans, could you discuss these developments and in regards to Germany, please? Yeah, I'll say um, a little bit about Germany, and then make, and maybe a little bit about what I think far right parties across Europe have in, have in common. Um, so, you know, in some ways, Germany is kind of a bit of an outlier, I think, um, uh, in this question of the far right. Um, I mean, for a long time, people thought that somehow Germany um, was a sort of an exception, right? We saw the far right on the rise across Europe, but a lot of people thought that Germany was some kind of um, exception. People thought it had some kind of immunity because of its history. Um, what's happened, um, you know, in the last, you know, I suppose five years or so is that you know, that illusion has been shattered. And actually now, in some ways, it seems to me that actually the problem of the far right in Germany, I mean, in some ways is even more alarming actually than, than in France and Italy, the two cases that Tara talked about. And the reason I say that is because the process that Tara has been describing 
um, where you have these far right parties that at least in some ways are becoming more moderate over time. Right. They're certainly sort of trying to present that image to the outside world. That they've become more moderate. Now, I would argue that they're doing that in some quite selective ways. And we need to sort of interrogate that a little, little bit. But they are nevertheless playing with the idea that they are becoming more moderate. Right. And so now there's, you know, increasingly, and I have this argument all the time, is increasingly a debate, you know, about whether it even makes sense to call Maloney far right. A lot of people, I think, are in complete denial about this now. But this has to do with the way that, you know, she is in some ways at least moderating. Right. And this from a party that, as Tara mentioned, you know, its genealogy goes back to the original fascist party. Right. Um, now, the trajectory of the AFD is almost the opposite of that. Right. But this is a party which is created out of nothing in, in, in 2013. And at that time, this is in the context of the euro crisis. And it's a party of basically, you know, liberal, ordo liberal economics professors who thought that Merkel had gone too far in bailing out the Greeks and so on. Right. This is what this party was originally about. Um, and then, you know, it's actually about to disappear. And then in 20, uh, you know, after the, the, the refugee crisis in 2015, it slightly reinvents itself. Um, and then it gets into the Bundestag for the first time in 2017. But if you compare the AFD of today to the AFD, even of 2017, let alone 2013, this is a much more radical party, right? It's been becoming more extreme over time, unlike, as I say, Maloney, Le Pen and so on. Um, and this is the remarkable thing. At the same time as becoming more and more radical, it's been getting more and more popular. Um, you know, to the point where you know it's um, started to get above twenty percent uh, in opinion polls. Now, the most recent development is the emergence of this new party, the so-called Bündnis Zara Wagenknecht, the alliance around this this figure Zara Wagenknecht uh, on the far left. Um, and this is kind of a complicated story, which I won't get into too much. But it seems to me that she, you know, her emergence has help to bring the AFD back down below 20%. So they're not doing quite as well as they were a few years ago. But it is quite remarkable if you look at um, the recent uh, regional elections in Germany, um, how well the, the AFD uh, have done. And um, and this is causing you know chaos in a lot of German states. Um, uh, and the tendency in Germany is to sort of essentially see this as an East German problem, right? This is the former states of the East Germany of East Germany. But you know, again, I think there's an element of denial here. If you look at, for example, the regional elections earlier this year in the two states of Hesse and Bavaria, you know, in Hesse the AfD got 18 percent, in Bavaria got 15 percent, right? So these are numbers that are almost the same as the numbers in the East. So this is a Cross German problem. And I think the other way, when you, one of the other things that's really interesting about the AFD is, as well as having this geographic um, uh, kind of, um, you know, they're, they're present across Germany in geographic terms. What's also really interesting about the AFD is that they are what is sometimes called in Germany a Volkspartei, which is usually translated as a catch all party. But the crucial thing about this is that. What what that basically means is that you're integrating different strata of German society, you know, from sort of elites through to working class people. Um, that's something which the AFD actually does very well now. This is, you know, all sections of German society. Um, so um, so as I say, I think we've now gone from a situation where we thought that, you know, in some ways Germany was was sort of a positive exception to, in some ways, I think this is even more alarming than what's happening in other European countries. Um, so in that sense, it's an outlier. But I think, um, you know, what it does have in common with um, uh, far right parties elsewhere, some of the cases that Tara was talking about um, is, you know, so I, I think it's quite difficult to, to talk about um, the causes of the rise of the far right in apolitical terms. I think this just looks very, very different if you're on the left than if you're on the right. And to put it in very sort of simple, brutal terms, people on the right think that the reason the far right is doing very well is because immigration is out of control and we need to get tougher on immigration. Um, that voters have legitimate concerns around, you know, um, around immigration, and that's the way to um, to respond to the rise of the far right. It's very much the position of centre right parties in Europe, like the EPP, the European People's Party. And, and, you know, roughly people on the left, you know, think that that's all wrong and, and that actually this is, you know, being driven much more by economic causes, in particular austerity. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's a, there's a, there's a you know, a, a sort of a, you know, an apolitical answer you can give. The one thing that I would throw into this, though, is that, you know, for all the differences between different far right parties in different parts of Europe, you know, one thing that they all have in common, albeit in slightly different degrees, um, is a kind of a Euroscepticism, right? And so I do think that, you know, 
a major factor in the rise of the far right in Europe, which does differentiate, I think, from the United States, is it's that the European Union itself is producing the far right. Thank you very much, Hans. That was very interesting, um, your take, especially about how the AFD, how it's evolved differently than, than, the, other, than the other parties. Um, now, if I can turn to you, Jeremy, could you discuss these developments of the rising far right and looking at the European Union in general? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I can pick up a little bit where, Han, where Hans left off, um, because I think that what's, what's interesting as you listen to the sort of details of the French and German cases, which Tara and Hans pointed out very um, expertly, is that, uh, and frankly, you could have done it in a dozen other different countries, they all have their particularities, which are quite important, of course, and they all have, they're based in the history of the countries, they're based in the in the institutional setup, whether they have a presidential or parliamentary, they're based in the party, the, the party landscape of a given country. And so each country has its own story. Um, and, you know, that's normal. Um, and of course, for each country involved, they think that their story is unique. Um, I know mine is. Um, and, you know, it is to a degree. But what's fascinating here is the, is the degree of commonality that we have. Um, within that, within those uniqueness. We have across Europe and the United States an, a, an increase in people voting for parties like this, kind of on the left and the right, but particularly the right. Um, and we're seeing uh, a, a slow, gradual, it's going, going back, I guess, at least 20 years now, certainly to the financial crisis in 2008, arguably before then, we're seeing a, a, a gradual accretion of, of voters going to these far right parties. Again, each, 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 there's different trajectories. Some are lagging further behind, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but actually the direction is the same pretty much everywhere. That is a really interesting result. It has had, it has had different effects in different countries and, but actually everywhere it's becoming more and more difficult to uh, govern without the far right um, or without the without the populist parties. And you're seeing in, in many different countries across Europe, they have this sort of concept of the cordon sanitaire. Everybody always uses French terms for this. I think it's because it sounds best that way. Um, uh, because it, probably that uh, the way you say that in German is a lot less pleasant. But um, Let's uh, there you go. <laughs> I was um, <laughs> Uh, but essentially what it means is that the establishment parties, the centrist parties, uh, establish a, uh, a, a norm that they will not govern with these far right parties, that they're outside the mainstream of politics and they create a cordon sanitaire around them. Um, this cordon sanitaire is to varying degrees breaking down across Europe because the numbers just don't work anymore. Germany, I would argue, has the strongest cultural cordon sanitaire for the reasons mm -hmm. that Hans mentioned, their history, but it's also breaking down. Um, and so it, it it will, and it has broken down in certain countries and in the countries that it hasn't broken down in basically, pretty at this point, pretty much every establishment party has to govern together in order to keep the far right out. And, and given that the erosion is continuing, we should expect that that won't last. Um, so... I guess the next question is, you know, what is the reason for this common uh, wave across Europe and the United States and maybe even beyond? And, you know, the fundamental answer is, I don't know. And there's a huge debate about this. Um, and you heard Hans talk a little bit about it. I think that the principal two causes that are attributed, I like, I very much like the way he sort of separated into left and right. It's not, to be, it's not quite that neat, but I think it's still quite useful. Uh, differentiation is that there's one people who think it's a, it's a, it's a fundamentally an economic cause, which is that uh, people have been left behind by globalization, uh, and that the, this has sort of eroded in the United States the the working class in Europe the, the whatever the, no I'm sorry in the United States the lower middle class in Europe what they call the working class, uh, and and then the second explanation is sort of immigration and the stress that that puts on the culture and on the social services. I think there's a lot to both of these explanations, but to me, they're not 
fully satisfying in part because the economic one particularly uh, sort of doesn't reckon with the fact that actually these are the very successful societies and actually economically speaking, they've done quite well. It's true, of course, that there are 20% of the people roughly in any of them, 20, 25, that are not really prospering, but actually that's true in any given society at any given moment, uh, at least. Uh, so you need a further explanation for what's happening. Um, and immigration is also slightly problematic, even though it's clearly the thing that most people cite. But if you look at a lot of countries that are experiencing this phenomenon in Eastern Europe, for example, Hungary, Slovakia, they have huge anti-immigration discourses that are at the root of these populist parties, but they have actually no immigrants. Um, so uh, it seems like immigration is a very important to the story, but you don't actually need immigrants to have that story. And so to me, something slightly deeper is going on, which is that there is a feeling of, I would point to two separate things, which are consistent with the economic and immigration explanations, but a little bit deeper, which is that there is a profound feeling of cultural dislocation happening across uh, Europe and, and the United States. And what this means is that, and immigrants are one carrier of this, is that people feel like they're losing their cultures. They're losing their nationality. And nationalism is by far the strongest force in politics in, throughout Europe and North America. And, um, and people are fighting back against that. And that's a, that is, uh, immigration is the sort of symbol of that, but it's a broader phenomenon, which, is, which, is, um, which has something to do with the, with the various ways in which cultures are being penetrated and eroded by liberalism, by modern, by, by modernity, by things like LGBTQ gay rights and all that, all that other stuff that um, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, people focus on quite a bit. Um, and then the second phenomenon is a sort of anti-establishment feeling, which you really see very prominently across Europe and the United States. Um, and, you know, this perhaps results from, um, let's say, successes of democratization. It is increasingly difficult, and, and also from communications technologies, it is increasingly difficult for um, establishments to sort of become insulated from their voters. And, and what we're seeing, and this, of course, is the definition of populism, what we're seeing across the Western world is that uh, demagogic leaders are increasingly successful at going around establishments like, like me and Tara and, and Hans and speaking directly to the people and making cases mm -hmm. to them uh, and appealing what I would to what I would call their worst instincts. Uh, and that increasingly because of the, because in part, because of how dem democratic we've become, in part because of the communications technologies and social media and all of that, this is an increasingly useful option. So I don't think those aren't exactly um, uh, explanations that are in tension with each other, but I think there are different ways of putting it. But I'd certainly be interested. I, I, I know Hans will always disagree with me, usually on the basis of definition, but, um, but I'd be interested to hear the others thinking on that. Can I jump in? And I'm sure Hans will jump in. I'll just mention the UK example, and I know he, I'm sure he'll come back to it. I was thinking about the the, the first uh, sort of explanation that Jeremy brought up about this feeling of cultural di dislocation, and it's hap that that's happening similarly in Europe and the US. I find that super interesting because you also see people who were formerly not that long ago migrants who also yeah. present this as an explanation for why they're voting uh, for anti-immigration policies and uh and and so i don't i mean maybe it's kind of a, a testament yeah. to how efficient <laughs> you know <laughs> integration can be that there's an old saying in the united states there's an old saying in the united states my family has had problem with immigrants ever since we came to this country so you know i think there's that in the us and i'd love for hans also to to jump in on the uk uh, situation because there's definitely that sense in the UK and thinking about immigration not in a generic sense but immigration against certain people immigrating and not against others and, and I think that's quite key too so I don't know how the this idea of cultural dislocation fits into these different layers and this differentiation but I think it's it's important to mention. And Hans? Um, thank you. And yeah, I mean, Jeremy and Tara, you both know me too well. It's a problem. Um, so yeah, there was, <laughs> I, I did want to respond to you, Jeremy, and, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll, 
I'm hesitating about the UK because because there's so much I could say about that, and I, I don't want to make this a discussion about the UK. But um, so on, first of all, on 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 the cordon sanitaire, um, you know, I think it's important to emphasise, I and mean, this is my view that. Um, the cordon sanitaire is not a solution to the problem of the far right. All it does is it buys you time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and, and here's the thing. I think that what happens is precisely because people don't look at it that way, they do almost think of it as being some kind of solution. What happens, and we're seeing, I think, multiple cases of this. Um, yeah, it makes it worse, arguably. Well, this is the thing, right? In the medium term, it makes it worse. So all, all it does is it buys you a bit of time for you then to come up with a strategy for dealing with the far right. But I think the way that it tends to function in practice is precisely because, as you say, the numbers often force you into this position. What happens, in at least in European countries, um, uh, you know, it's different, I think, in Britain and America, where you have a two-party system. But in, in continental European countries where you have coalition governments, you get these really incoherent um, uh, coalitions formed of parties that really have nothing in common except the fact they're trying to keep the far right out of power. Um, and so then what they've done is they've bought themselves some time, but then they can't do anything in the time they have that actually offers citizens anything. I think this is basically what we're looking at in France for the next three years. So, you know, I totally agree with what Jeremy just said, that what this actually then does is it strengthens Le Pen, not least because it strengthens the perception, which, you know, to some extent, justifiably, these parties have, that all of the mainstream parties form a kind of, you know, a, a sort of a block, right? Um, um, it strengthens that sense, uh, you know, that, that they're sort of ganging up against the far right. Um, and, I, and I absolutely agree that, that there's a certain kind of inevitability about the cordon sanitaire breaking down when the numbers just don't work. Um, so, so, you know, people turn this into some kind of moral question, you know, um, but, you know, they, it, it will break down when the numbers don't work. It has to. Right. And, and actually, from a democratic point of view, it kind of has to actually. Right. Um, and then on this. So on the cultural and economic explanation. So. I guess I just want to say, Jeremy, that I think um, the, the 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 economic causes. It's a little bit more complicated than just saying that. Just you, I don't think you can just reduce the economic causes of the rise of the far right to the people who are left behind from globalization. Um, there are multiple ways in which there can be economic drivers of the rise of the far right. So you know, first of all. I think it's important to sort of look at the distributional consequences of, you know, let's let's say hyperglobalization. Right? It's not so much did your country as a whole profit from it. You know, let's take Poland for example. Right, Poland has in a way has been one of the big winners in the last you know 25 years since the end of the Cold War. Right, if you look at the country as a whole. But there have been distributional consequences. And so, you know, you have some winners and some losers. And those losers, you, you can have those losers within a context of, you know, a context in which the country overall has won. And that, by the way, I think is also the, the German story as well. I think that's what I meant by left behind by globalization. Sorry? I think that's what I meant by left behind by globalization. Yeah. Right. Okay. But I, but I'm but I'm but I'm but I'm just saying it's not enough to just say look this country has been you know and and I don't think you were saying this but I think I do hear a lot of people saying this um, that just because this country overall has been doing well economically economics can't be one of the drivers of this right. So well, I guess maybe oh, I'm sorry. Um, what I would just to come back on that a little bit that what I'm getting at is that. Um, yes, definitely, there have been distributional consequences to globalization, which resonate in domestic politics in, in these countries. But the issue is that there is always people who are economically discontent, and there actually aren't more now than there generally have been. Um, so it, to me, it just doesn't work as an explanation for the sort of timing of all of this. Um, because um, what, in, what you need, you need this globalization explanation on top of it because actually that is a sort of foreign influence which which goes with the cultural erosion uh, and the lack of and the loss of control explanation. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the cultural dislocation bit in, in in a minute, but on the economic causes, so you know we we could argue more about you know about the timing and so on. Yeah. The other point I wanted to make on the economic causes is that there's another variety uh, of sort of economic drivers of of the far right. Um, which is not so much the losers, but precisely the winners. Because, so in other words, the reason they're voting for far right parties is precisely because they are the winners and they don't want to give up their wealth, right? And they fear their wealth being taken away from them. And by the way, you know the story of the AFD that I mentioned. You know that's the origins of the AFD, right? This was these are the winners from the creation of the eurozone, right? And they were saying we don't want to have redistribution in the EU and share our wealth with the Greeks and with the south of Europe, right? That's why they were voting for the AFD. So in other words, there are multiple ways, I think, in which the economic 
factors can drive the rise of the far right. Um, and then on the um, question of cultural dislocation, um, I guess I want to sort of, the part of that that I, that I most want to push back on, Jeremy, is, is the idea of sort of connecting it to nationalism. Um, because so if we take, for example, the case of, you know, because the implication of your argument. I didn't see that coming. I can't tell whether you're being. I said I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because because if we take, let's take, for example, the um, the case of Poland, right, where, you know, apparently, um, uh, or actually, no, let's let me focus on, on Germany, you know, um, it's remarkable how during the last you know couple of years since the war in Ukraine began, Germany has ex has has received almost exactly the same number of people from Ukraine as came in 2015, 2016 in the refugee crisis, right? Um, and um, and you know and, and the refugee crisis transformed German politics. It was a massive crisis. It produced, as I say, this iteration of the AfD. Um, it's had huge consequences um, uh, for the last decade. Whereas during the last two years, the arrival of a similar, you know, over a million people from Ukraine had almost no political consequences in anything like a comparable kind of way. And so what to me that illustrates is this isn't, you know, um, Germany feeling that its German culture is being, you know, eroded somehow. Actually, this is a collective sense of a European civilization that is being threatened by non-white people, essentially. So I just wanted to sort of slightly expand that out from the nationalism point. All right, thank uh, you very, thank you very much. Sorry to jump in, but we have limited no time. But I mean, this conversation could keep going. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, so then now I wanted to turn to you, Tara, just to look at, uh, you know, how do the far right movements, how do they impact both the US and Europe, the transatlantic relations in general, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities for collaboration? So there used to be this assumption, um, now that we're a, a bit less than four weeks out of the US election, uh, the presidential election here, there used to be this assumption that if Donald Trump came back to power, it would be a breakdown of transatlantic relations, uh, you know, that he would, uh, I think he would absolutely um, uh, quash NATO and, and reiterate uh, his dislike of alliances and multilateralism, but he would have partners in Europe that he could work with. And I'm thinking typically, of course, of uh, Georgia Meloni and Viktor Orban, uh, who have a very different view of what needs uh, to be done with Russia and Ukraine, uh, Israel and Gaza. And so you could see a form of a different axis. Of course, if you add France to that, if there's another general election or uh, you know, uh, until the presidential election in 2027, then you could think of a, a Washington, um, Paris, Budapest, Moscow axis, which would be quite different. So I don't think, I, you know, I think you could actually look uh, at potentially reinforced relations, not with the EU at all, um, uh, because he, Donald Trump really dislikes the EU, but with a number of uh, heads of member states, that's for sure. And what we're seeing now, in a way, even in terms of the priority setting by the European Commission, um, in its former mandate, it really uh, insisted quite a lot on fighting against climate change. The EU Green Deal was really central to both internal and external policies of the European Union. The manifesto that we're seeing coming through this time around is fairly different uh, and quite uh, convergent, I would say, with, with the current Republican Party, which is much less focused on uh, fighting climate change and much more focused on fighting against migration. And so you could, there could, you know, there could be some, some form of a convergence there. I don't know what it would lead to exactly, but we are definitely in this moment, and Jeremy and Hans spoke about this, where the cordon sanitaire is uh, thinning by the day. So in France, it kind of held uh, until the very last minute. And I'm guessing it's one of the last time where it holds. Uh, but you don't see the reflection of that in the constitution of the government. So typically, I mean, we were talking about coalition governments in Europe. France is also an outlier there in that it, does, it doesn't do, co it hasn't done, let's say, uh, to be more precise, coalition governments in the past 70 years. And even now, we're the results that came out of the election, uh, what the French voters said, were that they didn't want to give a majority to any one party because France is a majoritarian role uh, political system. We still didn't manage to come up with a coalition government. So basically, it's just a 
center-right, right-wing government right now, not reflecting at all the results of the election. And we're struggling with that. But other European Union member states already have social democrats and far-right uh, parties in their coalition governments. We see it in Scandinavia. Actually, they've been doing it for a long time. And precisely to the points that have been mentioned earlier, they're really struggling to come up with also common uh, common policies demonstrating to people who already feel disenchanted with elites and their representatives that they're actually up to no good. And so I think there is one huge question that people have, which is these far right parties or populist parties, conservatives, I don't know how to call them, and, and they're all different. So maybe we shouldn't call, you know, have one single name for them all. Um, but do they normalize when they come to power? Do they restrain themselves? Uh, is there kind of a process um, through which they go where they have to be less radical? And I think we have examples of both. We have examples of normalization sometimes, adaptation to the bureaucracy, adaptation to constraints. When uh, you're inside the European Union, you have to negotiate with your partners. And examples are of moments where you don't have to adapt and you actually can go through with the policies that you had announced because generally what populists and autocrats do is that they do what they had announced they would do and you should take them to their words and I think we're seeing that uh, in Georgia Meloni's case I would assume you would see that in in mine Le Pen's case as well uh, same goes for, for the AfD and actually uh, far-right parties in Germany are already present at the regional level uh, there are a number of regional governments who find themselves forced to work with them because they 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 are extremely present, not just in the political system, but even at the local association, local organizations level. And so I, I, I don't think that would, you know, I think it would be a massive change from transatlantic relations as we know them now. But I don't think it would necessarily mean a breakdown of them. It could there could be a form of ideological alignment that would take us in a vastly different direction. Thank you so much. And, and kind of continuing on with that theme, um, Jeremy, what has been the impact quickly on um, the European far right on the United States? And conversely, what has been the impact of Trump and the MAGA movement um, on, on Europe? And, and um, after this, I'll turn to questions um, in the Q&A box. So if anyone would like to put, post any questions, please put them in there. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, I released a paper on it this morning, um, so I feel qualified to answer it. Um, and I, the paper is called the, the Urbanization of America, Hungary's Lessons for Donald Trump. And basically what it tries to document in the first instance is the playbook that Viktor Orban in Hungary created for um, populist governance. He's been the most successful populist leader in, in the Western world by quite a bit. He's been in power since 2010. And, and since that time, he has very much remade Hungarian governance and we argue turn it into a sort of electoral autocracy. Um, if, if he calls it a liberal democracy, lots of other words, but it's a sort of weird combination of democracy and autocracy. Um, and, um, and, there have been quite a few links, uh, particularly actually since Donald Trump left office from uh, between the uh, the Hungarians and uh, the sort of broader Republican ecosystem around Donald Trump. And they have uh, they have learned quite a bit um, from the Hungarians. And if it's it's you know, it's quite unusual to see ideas flow from Central Europe to the United States, at least in the last hundred years or so um, used to be very common. Um, uh, but it seems to be happening again. And uh, one of the things, interestingly, that the, and, and so actually, if you go through, which we do in the paper, uh, some of the Donald Trump's and the broader Republican ecosystem's plans for governance, should they win another term, you see that they are learning the lessons of what the Hungarians did in Hungary, obviously applied to a very, very different context. Um, but that they are uh, they are really uh, adopting in in a in a modified way a lot of that playbook, and particularly one of the things that one of the Hungarian interviewees said to us in the project was, what we have taught them is how useful the state is for um, changing governance and how useful the state is for create for cementing your you in power and and that sounds a little bit obvious actually but for the Republicans in the United States. It's a bit of a revolution because they've had an ideology for the past 40 or 50 years of dismantling the state. And suddenly 
um, suddenly they are uh, they're learning that actually the state can be quite helpful for a lot of their goals. And so you're seeing, particularly in the last four years, a massive change in the way Republicans view the state and the capacity of the state to, to make social, change, social and societal change. Moving in the other direction, in terms of the influence of, of, um, of the United States on the European movements, I think that this is very much what Tara was, was getting at. So I'll just reiterate what she says and try to say it in different words so I also look smart. Uh, but, but really, um, the, the United States is, is uniquely unconstrained as a country. Um, if you become a populist leader like Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, or even in, in like Giorgio Maloney in Italy, you probably have to moderate because um, you have to you face a lot of external constraints coming from the EU, coming from the United States itself, and and just coming from the fact that you're small and the world is big. Um, and the United States is the least constrained country on earth, um, and and it can do a lot of things. It doesn't care what the EU thinks. Uh, it 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 is the United States, so it doesn't have to care what the United States <laughs> thinks. Um, and it's quite big in every sense of the word. And that and it, that means, first of all, that the United States can doesn't have to be as moderate if it has a populist government. The second thing it means is it can enable a lot of populist governments in Europe. And I think this is what Tara was getting at. Um, that if if um, if Hungary or uh, Italy is having problems with the Brussels bureaucracy in the EU, if it has an ally in the White House, it's going to have a lot fewer problems. Uh, it's going to be able to form a, a coalition. No, there's no country on earth that has more influence in Brussels than uh, than the United States, and that probably includes Paris. Uh, so um, I think that this has a real potential in the way that Tara got at to really uh, yeah, not reduce transatlantic relations, but but make them entirely different. You might see that there is a transatlantic coalition to oppose a lot of the agenda of the European Union. Uh, and you might find that there are um, European Union member states which are helping the United States to implement uh, anti-European economics tariffs and things like that. Uh, so this could be, I think, a real revolution in transatlantic relations. It'd be hard to say whether they're better or worse, but they will be doing something quite different. And they would get promises, one would assume, from the U.S. to have something in return, you know, high-end security sure. guarantees. I mean, there would be some kind of a increased bilateralization, I would assume, in that scenario. So it, it would be sure. very different. But I my sense is they would still both these uh, EU member states and the U.S., actively try to undermine the European Union itself as, as an institution. Joanna, do I have time to add a couple of sentences or do we need to go yes. to questions? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to slightly sort of complicate this sort of idea of, you know, a sort of far right in the US and Europe that's aligned and centrists in Europe and, 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 and the United States that are aligned. Because, you know, we were talking about Maloney, right? And, you know, if you think about how, say, Biden received Maloney in the White House. I mean, I can't get the image of him kissing her on the forehead out of my head, frankly. Um, oh, he loves and, her. Huh? He loves her. So, so, there's, so, so in a way, as I say, this is, a, this is kind of complicated. And so I, I guess the simple way that I would put this, and this is- You should so, see where Donald Trump will kiss her. <laughs> um, the, the way I think about this, and I hate to put it so brutally, but you know, I've increasingly come to the conclusion that both the EU itself and the United States don't have a problem with the far right at all. All they have a problem with is the, the section of the far right that's pro-Russian and anti-Atlanticist. Um, you know, so hence, you know, Orban is a problem, but not because he's far right, because he's not sufficiently Atlanticist and supportive of Ukraine. Whereas Maloney, you know, as I say, centrists both in, you know, Brussels and in, in Washington are perfectly happy with Maloney precisely because she is Atlanticist. Um, so I think this is a bit more of a complicated story. I'll stop there. Right. I, and I think that works for the United States. It doesn't work very well for the European Union, which, which is very unhappy with Maloney for a variety of reasons. Well, what are the reasons uh, then, Jeremy? Because, so I, I, you're right, if we're talking about the EU, I would add, so I, for me, for me the, the, uh, the really interesting thing when Maloney became Italian Prime Minister was how 
um, you know, the EU essentially embraced her as soon as she did two things. The first was to indicate her support for Ukraine, so she wasn't going to be pro-Russian. And the second was to indicate that she wasn't going to be disruptive on the Eurozone, you know, which even her more yeah. moderate predecessors like Matteo Renzi, you know, Social Democrat, had been, right? So she essentially accepted neoliberal e, you know, Eurozone economic policy. And then, you know, as I say, the, the centrists in the EU, especially the UPP, were totally fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's imp Maloney has moderated herself in a variety of ways to please both the United States and the EU. Yeah. Um, and that has been helpful. I would say that she wouldn't do that if she didn't have to. Um, but that she may does. Be true. That's the nature of being Italy. But also, she hasn't fully moderated herself. And, the, yeah. and, the, and, and you know, you saw that they had a lot of problems uh, in the formation of the new commission in negotiating with her about what her representation in the parliament would be and what her commissioner would have would be in charge of. And that reflected the fact that they were uh, very annoyed at the way in which she was trying to upset European governance through uh, organizing the far right and through the challenges that she was presenting to the European Commission. So so I mean, I think there's definitely a moderation, but to me that reflects, the situation that she's in, and and uh, and a very effect, a very astute politics, and that that is what would be relieved in part if Donald Trump was in office. All right, if I can jump in, so we can get just a few questions from our participants. Like I said, this is fascinating um, because you you all know each other, so a discussion could go on for a long time. Um, and I want to give other people a chance. So uh, there's a question here: How do we evaluate, determine differences between right? and far right. Would anyone like to tackle that? Sounds like a Hans question to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitional, <Hans>. right? <laughs> yeah, so look, I mean, political scientists are very clear about this. Um, and, and this is why a lot of this debate that's happening, you know, about, you know, are these far right figures really far right? It, it's, you know, it, it's, it's all in, you know, this debate is taking place, you know, completely ignoring all of the, you know, the the academic work on this. So, it, you know, it's very clear. There's this umbrella term called the far right, and that includes two different types of far right parties, the radical right, which is sometimes called the populist far right, and then the extreme right. And part of what I was describing in terms of the AFD is actually its shift from being a, a radical right party to being an extreme right party, which then in the German context means that you're essentially monitored by the domestic intelligence service and, and things like that. And uh, the simple way of putting that distinction uh, between the radical right and the extreme right is that, you know, the, 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 the radical right may have, you know, far right policies around questions like immigration and so on, um, but they're not, you know, um, uh, challenging, you know, the sort of so-called democratic rules of the game, whereas the radical right is doing that, right? So it's very clear. And so, as I say, you have these discussions now where people, you know, aren't aware of, you know, that way of that sort of framework, that conceptual framework. And so they'll say things like, well, you know, um, Maloney's not far right because, you know, she's not challenging democracy in Italy, right? As say, that, that would mean she's not extreme right, not that she's not far right. Um, so, you know, as I say, I think, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's very clear. I think what, what does sort of complicate it, and this is what, why, again, I find the debate about this so bizarre at the moment, precisely because, and Tara was talking about this, you know, what's happened over the last decade is that, you know, far right, you know, rhetoric and policies have increasingly been emulated, mimicked by centre right parties. And you see that very clearly in the United States with the Republican Party, right? But the same thing has been happening in Europe, as I say, going back to the refugee crisis in 2015, at least. Um, and because those ideas now, especially around question, policy questions around identity and immigration and Islam, have become so mainstream, right? in other words, centre-right parties have increasingly adopted them, but the conclusion that some people seem to draw from this is that the far-right doesn't exist anymore, which to me seems like such a mad conclusion to draw. Great, thank you so much. Um, then a question here for you, Tara. Can liberal democracy withstand the challenges posed by far right movements? I think that's the question that you know uh, underlines all. I mean, underpins all all our discussion right now. The question is, how does liberal democracy respond? How does it do it? Does it do it via the cordon sanitaire, which seems to be fairly outdated and actually unhelpful in the mid to long term, or does it do it? by tackling issues. So people, you have different varieties of this. Uh, some people on the left say we, you know, 
we usually don't touch the immigration topic and now basically all our votes are going to the far right because the far right has done so. So we need to think about security in a more holistic way and to tackle these issues that we've uh, stayed away from for a, from a long for a long time. Um, you have the right clearly emulating the far right. And I've seen this uh, in my own country where the Home Affairs Minister just days ago said that immigration um, was not an opportunity for France, that uh, migrants were not an opportunity, and that uh, when faced with certain situations, uh, we might actually not even respect the rule of law. So the Prime Minister had to uh, to actually react and, and disown his, um, his declarations, but he felt comfortable enough to come up with these on TV and to say them publicly. Uh, one huge question that we have, and I think the cordon sanitaire one is a pretty essential question, is if we accept uh, to give it up and to think of these far right parties, radical or extreme right, as being part of the political landscape, then how do we deal with them? How do we address the issues that they're coming up with? And I think all you know countries have and parties have different answers to this, but this is really problematic. It's used to be unacceptable they were you know just to, to even think about working with them they were not part of the republican arc and so they were excluded from the landscape now when you look at their vote shares basically they represent between 20, 25 to 35 percent of the vote share across europe um the question is do you work with them or not and does working with them reinforce liberal democracy or does it quite the contrary actually undermine it even more because their plan is not to respect democracy and not to respect uh, their political opponents which we've seen time and time again every time they do come to power with democratic means they tend to undermine their opposition fairly quickly uh, or to muzzle it even completely so i i mean i don't have a simple answer to that because i really don't know and as a citizen who votes myself i keep asking myself these questions all the time but what i've seen is when they do come to power they try to shut down people who disagree with them or who don't look like them thank you any other comments to add to to tara's comments I'll add, again, a slightly different sort of way of thinking about this, which is, you know, because I think there is this tendency to, to, to think in terms of this binary opposition between, you know, the far right and, and liberal democracy, or between liberalism and illiberalism, centrism, populism, there are all kinds of different iterations of this um, opposition. But I tend to think of actually a lot of the debate we're having not so much as being um, an argument between Democrats and anti-Democrats. This, for example, is the way that, you know, even when the AFD emerged in 2013 around these economic issues to do with the Eurozone, it was instantly framed by centrist parties in Germany as being anti-democratic. I think actually that's a bit unhelpful and that often um, this is not so much about Democrats versus anti-Democrats. It's about the balance between liberalism and democracy in a liberal democracy. Right. And what I mean by that is if you think about, you know, democracy as being, you know, popular sovereignty embodied in, you know, fair and free elections. And if you think about liberalism in this context, at least, as being about, you know, a system of individual rights guaranteed by a constitution, which you can then challenge in the courts and so on. Right. Liberal democracy has always been a kind of a balance between those two things. And I think a big part of what the populists um, are saying um, in these different contexts, you know, um, it is, you know, we think the balance has shifted too far away from democracy, in other words, popular sovereignty towards a liberalism. Um, and you see this very, very clearly in the European Union in this kind of aspiration, which European integration embodies, which is essentially, I mean, the way I would put it, frankly, is to replace politics with law. Right. In other words, to take areas of policy, especially economic policy, out of the space of democratic contestation and to create rules to govern them. Um, and, you know, Tara, I didn't talk about the UK earlier on, um, but, you know, this, this I think is very relevant to what was going on with Brexit, right? A big part of what was happening in Brexit wasn't an anti-democratic movement. It was precisely a democratic movement to say, we think that the balance between liberalism and democracy shifted too far in the direction of liberalism. And we want to bring some things back into the space of democratic contestation that have been taken out of it. All right. Thank you so much. And then um, there's a question here. What are the likely consequences of Europe's shift to the right? 
and I would just like to add, for example, when we look at, at France and Germany, their leadership role, the traditional leadership role within the EU, um, as we're seeing they're struggling with their own internal issues, and now you have uh, more representation from the right. So what are the likely consequences of Europe's shift to the right? So Jeremy, can I start with you? Sure, although I was hoping my question would be easier. Um, and just uh, one thing, I, we, we have five <laughs> minutes remaining, so if you can just do it for, you know, about a minute and a oh, half okay. person, that, yeah. I know that's okay, hard, but I, that'd be great. I made it even harder. Uh, <laughs> okay, sure. Look, um, the good thing about being Europe is that, you know, you, they don't have that much influence in the world anymore. So it doesn't so far, the, the um, shift of Europe to the right has mostly an effect in Europe, but it has a big effect in Europe. Um, and uh, I think that actually this gets a little bit at the previous question about the sort of survival of liberal democracy. Um, populists have yet to demonstrate that they have any actual formula for governance other than cutting off the next election. Um, uh, so uh, there, the thing is, is that if you look at the sort of, at Europe's actual problems, economic problems, uh, demographic problems. Immigration is actually a, uh, more of a solution to those, at least not on the cultural level, but on every other level, um, than uh, than a problem. And actually, Europe can't survive without immigration. Uh, survive is perhaps too strong, but it cannot prosper without immigration. Um, and uh, Europe also can't prosper, I would argue, without a degree of liberalism uh, that allows it to that has allowed it over time to be su such an effective. Uh, economic generator. Um, and it, so, so I think that the consequences for Europe are quite dire. Um, potentially, they, they create a possibility of economic stagnation or, or reinforcing the degree of economic stagnation that they already have. Uh, and if they create it, if they, if the uh, populists are, I guess, more the radical right ones in, in Hans's um, schema are successful at consolidating power and reducing real contestation in the system as they have been in Hungary, um, then there won't be an outlet for those failures. Uh, Hungary is a good example of this. I would argue that in Hungary, they haven't had very effective governance, um, but they haven't also had a very effective opposition because of the way they've been able to seize um, uh, civil society and seize the state and use it for to, to depress actual political contestation, which is a sort of irony of the point that that Hans was making, that they 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 did this for political contestation, but actually end up producing it. Um, so I think that that puts, potentially puts Europe in a very, very difficult place, which is that it has, uh, it has uh, governments which are not delivering and it has no outlet for actually uh, changing them. Um, that's a very dark scenario and we're quite far from that right now, but I think it's a possibility if we continue down this road. Thank you so much. And Tara, same question. Um, I mean, I second everything that Jeremy has said. Also, Europe is going in very different ways economically. Uh, you know, uh, von der Leyen produced an economic security strategy that was looking at how Europe could be more geopolitical, think about a strategic partnership. It was said to be country agnostic, but was evidently directed at China. And at the same time, we have this huge report by Mario Draghi, uh, which came out basically thinking at uh, showcasing how uncompetitive Europe was on the international market. And so the big question for Europe is economically whether it, it can find a balance between protecting its interests, first of all, defining, it, defining its interests and then protecting them, but at the same time using the openness of the market and what brought about its economic prosperity, which is the promise of, of this project. So, you know, I, I, I don't... I, let me just say I agree with Jeremy, and uh, and I I would be quite scared. Leave it there. Leave it there. <laughs> we can leave it there. Okay. Yeah, Hans, okay. if you want to add that, we can just close. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Hans, for your final comments, um, I, I'll say something which I don't think is going to happen as a result of the rise of the far right in Europe, which is the end of the European Union. This was something which a lot of people sort of assumed, actually, that that you know the rise of the far right would somehow lead to the end of European integration and the EU. Um, and I think one of the you know, one of the conclusions I've come to, you know, this brings us all the way back to the beginning with, with what Tara said. To me, what's so striking about Maloney is it illustrates, you know, she illustrates precisely this point that you can have a far right version of the EU. And actually to imagine what that looks like 
you don't need to imagine a radically different EU. You just need to imagine the direction that the EU has been moving in during the last 10 years, going further um, towards essentially some kind of fortress Europe. Um, that's you know what I think is going to happen rather than the sort of end of the EU as such. Great. Well, I want to thank the three of you for a really very thoughtful and enlightening discussion. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the conversation because there was so much um, intermingling of ideas and discussion. Um, and, uh, and I want to thank you again for a, a very interesting conversation on, on the far right, um, both in the US and, and mostly in Europe. So just a few housekeeping notes. Um, just wanted to let you know about uh, upcoming events. We have um, we have an event on October 28th for the New York premiere of People of the Book. Um, so it's something that you could sign up for with discounted admission and complimentary glass of wine. That sounds good. And also, I believe on October 29th, we have Young Bang and Jennifer Swanson. Um, one is Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army, the other is Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Data and Engineering. And they're going to be talking about leading tech, the future of Army innovation and civilian partnerships. And then finally, we bring these uh, virtual briefings uh, to you for free, and we'd love to continue doing them. So please, if you consider donating to Network 2020, we are a nonprofit, we would be very grateful. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are viewing from. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.